if you try and imagine that you are under attack by a yak fighter, you're trying to take evasive action. In the unlikely event that you're going to lose the aircraft, you've got to get yourself out of that seat and you've got to get yourself 50 or 60 feet backwards into the only door that you can exit the aircraft out of without jumping into the uh, number three propeller. Welcome to Cold War Conversations. Massive Soviet military forces have invaded the small, non-aligned, sovereign nation of Afghanistan. Good evening. The stunning overthrow of Mikhail Gorbachev by communist hardliners dominates the news this Monday. Gorbachev was reported under house arrest as Soviet tanks took up positions throughout Moscow. And I'm here to host this final program from the German Democratic Republic League. I'm here today at the REF Burton Wood Heritage Centre near Warrington in the UK. It's based on what was once the largest military airbase in Britain. The Heritage Centre was established to preserve and uphold the history of the men, women and activities that occurred here. Now, many of our fans are the proud owners of a Cold War Conversations coaster, a gift from me to thank them for helping the podcast financially. For the price of a cup of coffee a month to cover the show's increasing costs and keep us on the air, you can get a coaster too. Just head over to patreon.com slash coldwarpod. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash coldwarpod. Over 8,500 Americans were based at RAF Burton Wood during World War II and over 70,000 service personnel served here during its 54-year history until its closure in 1993. The Heritage Centre packs a lot of history in and make sure you listen to my unforgettable visit to the cockpit of an actual C-54 Skymaster as used in the Berlin Airlift. We welcome John Cotterill, the Heritage Centre Manager at REF Burtonwood, to our Cold War conversation. Now, we are Cold War Conversations and we are going to focus on the Cold War history of Burtonwood, but we will also be touching on World War II as well. So, John, what, what can you tell me about the, the sort of World War II history of Burtonwood, just as a precursor to the Cold War? OK, well, Burton Wood actually opened in 1940 for the Royal Air Force as a maintenance unit, number 37 maintenance unit. And for that period, it started to specialise in American aircraft that the RAF were using, such as Brewster Buffaloes and things like that, Douglas Bostons. Uh, so it became a centre of excellence in the UK for American aircraft. When the Americans joined the war in 1942... They were looking for a maintenance depot, and the logical place to come to was Burton Wood because of the fact that most of what they were doing was on American aircraft, so they were already set up for it. Given the proximity to Liverpool in particular to bring the uh, stores and su supplies in, uh, it was decided that it was a pretty ideal place to, to set up the maintenance depot. The other thing, the controlling factor there was um, also the engineering expertise in the northwest of England was all close to Burton Wood should they need anything producing from a subcontractor. Right and so by the end of World War II this was a, a massive air base and a very important cog in the Allied military supply network. By the end of World War II there were 18 and a half thousand troops here. Burton Wood known as Base Air Depot number one was one of the three base air depots in the country Wharton being base air depot number two, and Langford Lodge being base air depot number three, all of which were convert, uh, controlled by base air depot area, which was based at Burton Wood. Um, on, on top of that, it had about 56 airfields under its control um, for reserve storage mainly of the modified aircraft that they'd produced here. So, John, what happened at the end of World War II? What happened to the base then? Well, for a time at the end of World War II, the base was then given the completely opposite role of scrapping the aircraft that they'd been 
diligently maintaining over the past three years. So over a period of approximately 12 months, uh, three and a half thousand airplanes got scrapped here. Predominantly flying fortresses, P-47 Thunderbolts and Mustangs. Um, that ran to mid-46, by which time then uh, the base was closed, um, put into care and maintenance for a short while. The RAF came back in. They were doing pretty much what the uh, American Air Force had done. So war surplus aircraft came, came here. So instead of B-17s, we had Lancasters, we had Mosquitoes, we had any aircraft you can think of in the RAF inventory were brought to Burton Wood, presumably for disposal of. Um, some of them would have gone el elsewhere. And that ran right the way through till about April 1948. And of course, in 1948, a pivotal moment in the Cold War with the Berlin Airlift. What was Burton Wood's involvement in the Berlin Airlift? Burton Wood's involvement was um, the maintenance of the aircraft that the American Air Force were flying, predominantly the C-54 Skymasters. Um, every 200 hours, those aircraft needed a major overhaul, which involved 800 man-hours of service time. And so Burton Wood was identified as the place to do that. Um, so it was reactivated. It brought the Americans back to Burton Wood. Because had it not been for that, I don't think they would have been back here. And I don't think they'd have, they'd have uh, taken over a lot of the other equipment that was here and expanded the base for later use in the Cold War. Yeah, so the... the I spoke with uh, Gail Halverson, the candy bomber, in a, in a previous episode. And the, the Skymaster, was that the sort of plane that he was flying? Yeah, it's exactly the plane that uh, Gail Halverson was flying. Um, I think I might be right in saying that the Skymaster carried the biggest load of all the um, airlift aircraft, that's RAF or, or United States. It carried a 10 ton load. Um, and I th at one point, they were probably making two, if not three, trips from Frankfurt to Berlin and back in a day. Um, Gail Halverson was one of those pilots, yeah. Yeah, no, I was I was very honoured to uh, speak with him, and he did tell me about a really uh, frightening incident where he was flying in and a Soviet fighter suddenly appeared out of cloud in front of him and he had to take a, evasive action. Happened quite a lot. Um, I don't think they were actually officially ever fired on the aircraft, but they did try to force them out of the sky. They were trying to make the pilots take such evasive action that they'd lose control of the aircraft. That was their goal in life um it did happen once or twice uh but there was always the threat of uh what was waiting in the uh at the american air fields over here lake and bent waters and places like that because they did back it up at that time with b-29s which were nuclear armed so the russians although they did try to get in the way of the airlift they didn't actually use any weaponry to do that it was more or less trying to make the aircraft the pilots lose control of the aircraft without actually shooting at them Right, right. So what can you show me here in the Heritage Centre that is um, from that sort of late 40s, 50s period? Well, the main thing we've got is the nose section of a, a Skymaster aircraft. Um, we use it to tell the tale of the Berlin airlift, uh, including the tale of the Candy Bomber, which is Gail Halverson's official nickname. Um, a lot of people don't these days don't know about the airlift but it was a pivotal role in the formation of nato and it was pretty much the start of the cold war it escalated further on to on beyond that but it was an 18 months of absolutely manic um work by predominantly the united states and the british governments to keep the people of berlin fed basically um as a result of that as i said nato was formed and then um, politically we got involved later the Berlin Wall went up in the early 60s, right the way through to 1989. Right. Well, we'll be uh, visiting that aircraft cockpit later on, so uh, don't miss out on that. Um, so let's just have a, a walk through here. Um, so the, the first thing that, that I immediately see is that you've got this map here of um, Burton Wood sort of showing the e expansion of the base. Yeah, the map was actually made by the United States Army in the 1960s and we inherited it when we when they left and we opened the museum up um it shows the airfield in its largest um footprint if you like which was from the 1950s because the main runway had been extended to just short of 10,000 feet and that was 
exclusively to take the uh, Cold War bombers that the Americans were using at those times, such as the B-66, the B-47, and famously the B-36 Peacemaker, um, which needed all of that length of runway to get it into the air. Uh, massive expansion again took place mid-50s. The whole airfield was modernised, all the living accommodation was updated, and they put up what was the biggest single-storey warehouse in Europe at the time to store the um, equipment they needed to support the massive amount of um, strategic air command aircraft which were based in the south of the country. OK, OK, let's walk on uh, a little further. There's some great models here of some of the uh, aircraft. Yeah, we've got a model exhibition here. Uh, pretty much every model that's in that case would have been at Burton Wood at some time in its life, ranging from the um, Tiger Moth down at the bottom end right the way through to the Vulcan bombers, the V-bombers, which were here till the late 60s. Um, some of them are airlift era, some of them then stretch into the 1950s. All the 50s aircraft had a role to play in the Cold War. I wasn't aware of the uh, Vulcans being based here. What, what was that about? Well, once the American Air Force left in 1959, the RAF designated Burton Wood as one of the emergency scatter airfields to be used by the Royal Air Force, uh, or uh, in particular the V-Force. In the event of a nuclear strike, the uh, V-Force would have been scattered around the country to airfields like Burton Wood with a long enough runway. They, put, they built operational readiness pads to hold four aircraft and they would have sat there armed awaiting instruction. I think I'm right in saying that the original plan was to, a percentage of the aircraft would be would already have targets to go to and would be on the way to those targets. Presumably there were um, hostile aircraft coming towards us with nuclear weapons on. The aircraft that were scattered around the country were basically the second wave, so whatever was going to happen would have happened, and then somebody, somewhere, would have taken stock of what was left and maybe being able to put on a second, maybe even a third attack by the aircraft that were scattered here, there and everywhere up from Scotland right the way down to Cornwall. Burtonwood was one such airfield. Right. No, thank thank you for that. A uh, uh, hidden part, certainly from my point of view, of the Burtonwood history. Um, we're showing some of the entertainment that the American troops had on the base. Um Mainly some of the, the clubs, they had several clubs on here, the officers club, the NCO club and things, and pretty much every night there was something going on. Um, 246 dances per year were held across the base somewhere, So uh, and other things in between. Um, they involved a lot of the families as well, because by the 50s the, the guys were bringing the families over here. Um, they weren't just sort of on their own. Um, the wives and the children would, would be here, and they even had a school on the base for the children. Interesting fact there is that the school buses that ran the children back and to to the school covered nearly a thousand miles a day running the children round the northwest of England because they weren't just living on Burton Wood. That's an, that's an, I'm, I'm still staggered by the stat of the 240 odd uh, dances a year. Yeah, it's uh, everything about Burton Wood are big numbers. It's it, it was just a colossally big place, the biggest air base in Europe by the end of the Second World War. Um, and there must have been in excess of 20,000 people here. Now, again, we're going back a little bit, but just to give an idea of the numbers, um, a normal bomber base would have maybe between three to 5,000 people on it. Uh, Burton Wood, 18,500 Americans plus another 3,000 civilians. Um, and again, normal bomber base, maybe 50 aircraft on there. Burton Wood, any one day, could have four to 600 aeroplanes on the ground. So it was colossally big. It was used to being big, and they kept that going. It had one of the longest runways in the country in the 1950s, the biggest storage facility in the country. Um, just huge, huge place. But they did look after the guys. They did give them a lot of entertainment. Some of the stars, the 40s and 50s came here. Uh, it, it, you just need to pick anybody that was a big star in the, in the United States, certainly in the 50s, and they would have performed for the troops at Burton Wood. Okay, thank you for that. Once the airlift had finished, Burton Wood was then um, reactivated as a strategic air command support base. Um, so that was then responsible for the um, maintenance of the aircraft that the Americans were using over here at the time. So that went from a B-36 bomber right the way down to an F-86 uh, fighter. 
anything in between that would come to Burton Wood uh, to have work done on it. So whatever they needed um, facility-wise was put in here. Um, engine maintenance right the way through. They had a factory site which could make anything for an aircraft. If they didn't have it, they could make it. Um, and they had a, a massive three and a half million square feet of storage space. Uh, still wasn't enough. Still had crated storage outside, engines and, every, uh, and things. Um, they had a, an engine section, which during the Second World War had produced 30,000 aircraft engines. That carried on through the 50s. They would rebuild radial engines in particular, but then they started to specialise in, in the jet engines as they came into prominence. Um, on the site we're actually on now, which was site four of the airbase, the University of Maryland had its technical training institution on here. Um, for anybody that's familiar with the site, it's right where Gulliver's had built the hotel. Um, and that was to keep the guys up to speed <coughs> on everything that was going on, the advancements in the technology, because pretty much every new aeroplane that came in was different to the last one. The jet engines were developing um, at a rapid rate, and so the guys who were maintaining them also needed to do that same development. Uh, so it was a very, very busy place, not just for the uh, actual hands-on stuff but there was a lot of training going on here as well right and it it so it sort of winds down at the end of the 1950s and then france pulls out of nato and it it changes again yeah by the 57 ish the americans then had decided to um pull out quite a lot of their equipment from uh, the uk and concentrate on airfields like Bentwaters, Lake Neath, Mildenhall, Molesworth, places like that. So Burton Woods' role was finally wound down in 1959. A lot of the kit was transferred predominantly to Molesworth at that time, um, and the Air Force left um, pretty much completely by 1960, although they did maintain a small staff here in, in through the early 60s. But it was at that point then that the RAF took it on board um, to use as the scatter field that we refer, uh, for the V force that we referred to earlier, uh, it was only the runway that they maintained. They didn't really bother with any of the buildings. Um, and what would happen occasionally would be that four Vulcan bombers would arrive and practice takeoffs from Burton Wood. As one Vulcan pilot told me a couple of years ago, we just came and kept the place, make sure the runway was still open and not full of weeds. Um, <laughs> which was somewhat of an understatement but that's what they did right and and i remember driving past here on the m62 where you could see parts of the runway and a lot of the huge hangars were still there but they've all now gone haven't they yeah everything's gone now i mean the m62 is actually the main runway it was built over the top of about 1972 i think they started doing that but for a long long time after that maybe up to about 1983 um the airfield was pretty much complete. Control tower was still there. The hangarage was still there. All the hard standings were still there. And the other runways were still down. Uh, it was just mining substance, really, that got hold of it in the end. Um, and even then, the M62 suffered from that. Um, about early 80s, I think they had to actually put a, an artificial bridge across it because it dropped about 12 feet. So um, it wasn't the best of things to put a motorway over the top of, but they, they sorted it out. 1983-84 was the start of the demolition process and by 1988 all of the south side of the M62 had more or less been removed. In 1988 I think the last building they actually took down was the control tower which um, infamously was done by Fred Dibner because it was a, that was a pretty much a, uh, a landmark for many many years in, in this area and it only actually had something like a four-year service life. I think it was built about 1955, and they stopped using it by 1959, so it didn't really pay for itself in that respect. But by 1988, the south side had gone. By 2008, the north side had been cleared as well, and that's since been redeveloped into what they now class as Omega North. Yeah, it's uh, warehousing for large companies who want to ship stuff very easily using the... Uh, the the motorway now okay so let's move on a little bit further i mean one of the um display cases that uh, caught my eye was uh, some sporting memorabilia that in the cold war there were even though the uh, troop numbers were, were lower 
the Americans continued with their favourite sport. So we've got some bowling balls and skittles. Um, of course, you have to have a baseball as well. What can you tell me about the um, the American uh, social life while while they were here? Well, we've already touched on the the entertainment clubs that they had, but they had a massive sport inside to the um, to the base. It had its own bowling alley. Uh, it had several baseball squares uh, down a couple of american football pitches but they had clubs for everything boxing bowling baseball basketball they even had a motorcycle club uh, in fact they had two one was the american eagle motorcycle club and one then later on became the ramblers motorcycle club um so everything was given to them to try and entertain the guys uh, while they were here if they didn't have a dance to go to, they'd have some sort of sporting facility to um, to take the mind off the, the fact that they were three and a half thousand miles away from home in the northwest of England. The memories of it are always rain and fog. We don't get the fog now, but we do still get the rain and a lot of mud in the early days. So everything was was created for them to, to try and keep them entertained. Sadly, however, it didn't work that well because mainly the pubs in the local area were, had a bigger draw than they did a baseball pitch. <laughs> as ever, as ever. So we're just going to uh, walk a little bit further round. And uh, there's a great aerial photo of the uh, the airfield in June 1956, which I will uh, take a photo of and I'll, I'll share that in the... Um, the show notes and i think you showed me down here you've got sort of like a gallery of stars who we uh sort of mentioned before who uh visited the base to entertain the troops there's a signed photo of bob hope gene simmons was here tell me about some of the other stars well starting in in the war years um <clears throat> some of the biggest stars in the world came to burton wood bing crosby was here Glenn Miller performed here in August 1944. Bob Hope came over. General Eisenhower was a regular visitor to uh, basically G up the troops. And then later on into the 50s, the stars kept coming because there was such a big number of people here. Um, Nat King Cole, Gene Simmons, Prince Philip came on a, an official visit, Billy Graham, Joe Louis, uh, pretty much anybody you can think of in the American inventory at that time as an entertainer would have performed at Burtonwood at some point. Bob Hope came two or three times, and in fact, uh, on one of his visits, he was actually given um, the honour of becoming Honorary Commanding Officer for the day. He asked the commanding officer that actually gave him that, uh, what powers did he have? He said, you can do anything you want, Bob. So he promptly gave everybody the rest of the day off, which went down very well with the, all the troops, and it was honoured. Brilliant, brilliant. I, I love stories like that with... Uh authority being usurped there so uh fantastic have we got anything else cold war down here oh. so we're looking at a mock-up of uh, the resupply store at the base so uh showing all spare parts and what have you so john what what can you uh, tell me about this well in 1959 when the Ameri americans were moving out they had a massive big sale a huge sale and people could buy a jeep for five pounds. They could buy a two and a half ton truck for 15 pounds. And um, a farmer from North Wales came down and bought a selection of, of spare parts. And there's all sorts in here. There's gaskets, there's bearings, there's rivets, there's electrical switches, there's cockpit lights, uh, wing lights, you name it, it's in here. Uh, and he, he had that in his, it stored in a barn for over 40 years. We managed to buy it back off him. And we've put it back on display in here. So the parts range from 1941 right the way through to 1959. Um, innocuous in the selves, but as a collection, they're priceless. When we bought the um, Skymaster cockpit section, uh, it was in a pretty poor state internally, especially the cabin lights had all rotted. When we actually then took a look into our supply section here, we found we had... 20 brand new cabin lights which is exactly the ones that fitted in the Skymaster um, and also some cockpit instrumentation was missing which we replaced and some switch gear and everything so it was quite useful for that that's brilliant that's brilliant I really like that I mean this is like fascinating bits I'm just looking at some of the um, parts here January the 10th 1944 and uh, it's built by Studebaker the famous uh, lorry truck truck 
and cars sorry you see i'm not really that up on uh on the vehicles but yeah there's dials lights belts pratt and whitney other famous names from the aviation industry dupont rivets and uh countless others i'll uh i'll show some photos of these as well john should we uh take a step outside oh there's more you pack a lot in here john you know <laughs> um burtonwood didn't really ever have any operational aircraft uh flying from it apart from uh the in the 1950s which was the 53rd weather reconnaissance squadron they flew uh, aircraft which were designated as wb-50s which was an updated b-29 super fortress and they were doing weather reconnaissance flights out over the Atlantic, uh, up to the North Pole, and out over into the Baltic areas, um, two or three times a week, 16-hour flights, pretty tedious flights, recording weather patterns at various heights and reporting them back by radio to either a weather ship in the Atlantic or back to Burtonwood so that they could be rel relayed onwards. Later on, much later on, it was discovered uh, as part of those flights, they were also taking air samples. Uh, the air samples were... 100 percent to taste, measure uh, atomic particles so that they could try and work out what the threat was or where the soviet threat was where they were up to with their uh, atomic program um so filters would be returned off the aircraft to burton wood and they had a laboratory then which was tasked with measuring the radio levels radioactivity levels and the type of radioactivity that the samples were holding um as part of those flights if anybody had ever written to Santa during the 1950s and posted the letter addressed Father Christmas North Pole, such like, those letters actually got delivered to the North Pole by the 53rd Weather Reconnaissance Squadron from Burton Wood. There was an arrangement with the Royal Mail. The Saxon Mail were delivered here, and the guys would tip them out of the flare chutes, etc., once they overflew the North Pole. You have to remember it was a 16-hour flight, and it was a, a pretty boring flight. So to break the monotony up, uh, that's the type of thing they were doing. They did look after the children very well. Um, and that was went on for a, a number of years until they, uh, they, got, they moved the squadron out. Oh, that's another great story, John. I'm, I'm liking these, uh, these that you come up with. And there's a photo of the Santa Claus Express with uh, the sacks being loaded on so i'll try and remember to get a photo of that for you as well so we're just about to go outside now the heritage center is uh housed in a variety of buildings funded by gulliver's world amusement park um which is right next to the heritage center so as we go outside you will hear children screaming and various uh, noises that you would expect from an amusement park so i'm just warning you in case you wonder why there's these uh, strange noises in the background we're now going to uh step into the sky master which is uh, something i've certainly been looking forward to on this tour just going up the steps now So there is a section of cockpit and a short section of fuselage as well here. So, John, tell me uh, a little bit about this. Well, this aeroplane was brought over to the United Kingdom. It last actually <coughs> flew in 2002. And its last flight was a transatlantic flight to uh, what was RAF North Weald. It was brought over to tell the tale of the Berlin airlift, but more importantly, to tell the tale of... Gail Halverson and the candy bombing um, or Operation Little Vittles that it became. This one with an, uh, another uh, C-54 were flown into North Weald. Um, sadly, the film um, producers decided to pull the plug on the film and it never got made. So the two aircraft have sat there ever since, uh, basically just rotting away. We got hold of this section uh, in December... 2015 and we brought it down here um did quite a bit of work on it uh set it back at the original height it should be on a stand and then we've kitted it out internally so we can see 10 people inside and we can tell the tale of the airlift and in particular of the candy bomber
it's got that unique smell that old aircraft have of oil i think it is is it oil that i smell it is oil and the warmer the weather gets the stronger the smell gets it because there are hundreds of cables running under our feet all of which are cased in grease and oil uh, and as it warms up you do get that lovely old airplane smell um conversely in the winter it's like a fridge but in the summertime it's got a real atmospheric smell to it yeah it's not bad today maybe they should turn that into an aftershave i don't know um so i'm just walking through into the cockpit area um here and uh there's one position which i'm presuming is radio operator yeah they would have had a crew of five um pilot co-pilot radio operator flight engineer and navigator so we've got a radio um operators area set up um later on this airplane was converted to modern avionics Although if you look at them today, they don't look too modern, but to enable it to fly the Atlantic. So the navigator's position was taken out. Um, and in truth, it probably flew with a, a pilot and a co-pilot when it flew the Atlantic. Right, so I'm just stepping forward to look at the, um, the pilot and co-pilot seats. And I mean, when you compare it to a modern cockpit, it just looks like, well, I was going to say something from the last century and it obviously is something from the last century but um it's all knobs and and dials and levers it's you know a classic 1940s um layout of an aircraft in fact it, it does look quite spacious it looks like there's almost quite decent leg room there there's quite a lot of leg room i think the thing that restricts you getting in and out is the, the modern radio sets that they put in uh, but we do get a lot of current um especially commercial pilots coming in that are normally flying you away on uh, EasyJet or whatever on your holidays they love coming into this cockpit layout because they don't see it anymore theirs is all computerised and they, they do get quite uh, quite uh, nostalgic about how it actually these things did look modern airliners are, are obviously fully computerised and uh, it's like being in an, in an office really this is definitely fly-by cable as against fly-by wire um, and it's something that uh, is quite appealing to a modern pilot just to, to sit in the seat of these things and see just how little room you've got in comparison and just what, what small amount of vision you've got, really, um, for an aircraft of such size. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. So John is very kindly taking the chains off so that I can sit in one of the uh, seats. So I feel very honoured to be able to do this. So uh, give us a moment. And... I recommend that one. Okay. We do have a leak. Oh dear. I don't know whether the uh, microphone picked that up, but um, John recommended that I go in the co pilot seat as there's a leak with the pilot seat and it will be a little bit damp. Now, I'm six foot and this does feel reasonably comfortable but this uh so that is is this hydraulic so i mean would they have had to really pull on these uh controls to to fly it the hydraulics um don't exist on the flying controls so everything is pretty much um number one issue left and right leg and uh, um and arm albeit there are some modern features on it there's a uh, automatic pilot system on it and everything but everything else is pretty much pull on the steering column and you're moving cables and pulleys um, by the strength of your arms, they hadn't uh, they hadn't got into that in 1946 or so. So this is proper manual. I know there's the term "fly by the seat of your pants," but th this is you really having to use physical strength to fly the aircraft. Yeah, pretty much so. Um, obviously, once it's flying, you get it trimmed up and everything. It would fly uh, like a normal aircraft does, but the actual movement of the controls is down to you. There are no um, there are no hydraulic motors and etc pushing it pumps and stuff pushing it back and two for you so that incident i mean i'm just trying to take you know imagine gail halverson who we spoke to spoke about before the candy bomber and that um situation where you know the yak fighter appears out of the cloud in front of him and he has to take evasive action he's physically having to pull on the joystick here and do whatever else with the the levers to do that i mean it, it just seems beyond imagination yeah i mean it's, it is flying by the seat of your pants really it's it's um similar to the lancaster bomber pilots and the 
B-17 pilots during the war because it's that era of an aircraft. This one was built in 1946. Um, later on, they became more automated. Um, and so the pilots had uh, assisted controls, but this one is pretty much... Um, you turn it with your hand and that's as much effort as you need to get whichever control surface you need to go, either your hand or your feet. But there was no power controls on it as such. Wow. Wow. Right, so um, I've just had a uh, a quick pull on the joystick and and john has has told me that the the feel of these the the joysticks currently is is nowhere near what they were like because the cables are uh disconnected but um an amazing experience to sit in the cockpit of one of these aircraft and try and imagine what it would be like flying one of these during the berlin airlift right the window to your right or this one with the windows they bail the candy bars out oh right so this is where Gail would have sat with his uh, homemade parachutes on the uh, candy bars, opened the window and dropped them out. Wow. Wow. I know I say wow a lot on this podcast, but this is a, a, a definitely a wow moment. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm very much enjoying this, and I will email Gail and let him know that I've sat in one, in one of these. Um and uh, ask him whether he visited Burtonwood, because uh, we're, we're not sure whether he would have done, but there's a good likelihood he may have landed at Burtonwood. Yeah, you've got to think he would have brought his aircraft over uh, for maintenance at some point. So um, it'd be nice to think that he did come over here. Whether they had ferry pilots to bring them back or two, I, I'm not sure, to be honest with you. Maybe they just kept the, the pilots back and two to, to fly in the lift and put them in a different aircraft. But Gail could perhaps give us an answer to that one if you, if you do speak to him. I'll try and find out for you. I'll try and find out. Just while you're trying to get yourself out of the seat, if you try and imagine that you are under attack by a yak fighter, you're trying to take evasive action. In the um, unlikely event that you're going to lose the aircraft, you've got to get yourself out of that seat and you've got to get yourself 50 or 60 feet backwards into the only door that you can exit the aircraft out of without jumping into the uh, number three propeller. Uh, so it's quite a bit a feat, uh, especially if the aircraft's spinning. That's something that you maybe want to imagine as you're just trying to pull yourself out of this seat now. Um, I can't really imagine that, but yeah, just trying to extricate yourself out out of here and get back down the air. Yeah, it just doesn't bear thinking about. It. And presumably, I'd have a parachute on as well, so I'd be quite bulky. Or would I need to strap that on as I was trying to get down the other end? I would expect you might have to strap it on. Um, that's if somebody had given you the parachute in the first place, but <laughs> presumably you have got one. But yeah, it, it would be that. And also you've got to um, negotiate all the cargo that might be in it. Um, again, that might be uh, floating around in the air if the aeroplane is doing all sorts of weird and wonderful twists. So not the easiest of things to get out of. Um, and I would imagine the rest of the crew have got themselves to the back of the aircraft long before you did. So uh, it's just um, it's quite weird. To think that you you've got to try and pull yourself out of this while the airplane could be doing any sort of weird and wonderful maneuvers. I wonder how well I'm going to sleep tonight after uh, have, having that thought. But thank you for sharing that that insight, John. Right here we go. Getting out in a completely stable aircraft, um, which is not easy. There's not a, an easy yeah, way. On yeah, do. I've got a bulky parachute on and trying to get to the back of the yeah, aircraft. Of here because if the engines are still running, which they would likely to be, you, if you go out of the crew door at the front, there's a 13 foot diameter propeller spinning just about six foot beyond the door. So if you were to jump out of that, you're going straight into that one. So it's a case of working your way down the aircraft to the double cargo doors at the back to get yourself out. Right. And being the pilot, you would be the last one out because you'd be trying to hold the aircraft stable for the rest of the crew to get out that's right that's the pilot's role is he's got to get it um airborne keep it airborne long enough for the rest of the crew to get out and then he makes his way out any which way he can really so uh not a good position to be in no no <coughs> but very honored to actually step into the cockpit of one of these aircraft um in the uh footsteps of so many heroes do you know the actual crew that that flew this one no we don't um this particular airplane uh was an airliner um it was built in 46 so this particular one didn't fly the airlift but this type did 
Um, so it had quite a, a long career. It was an airliner until about 1962. And then at some point it had all the seats removed and was configured to become a cargo aircraft. So the difference was that it was originally built as a DC-4 and it was configured later to the same configuration as a C-54, which was the transport variation, the military transport variation of the Skymaster. Various crews would have flown it. Lufthansa owned it for a while. Trans-Canadian Airways. It was flying in South Africa for, for a while. New Mexico. Until it eventually ended up in a, in a desert boneyard in Arizona. And it's from there that they retrieved it to uh, put it in a state that it could fly again and bring it over to the UK to uh, to make the film that sadly didn't get made. Right, right. Thank you for that. We have a, a certificate um, which was awarded to the guys who worked at Burton Wood on the airlift, um, 59th Air Depot wing it become by then. This particular certificate was a guy named Harold Sickles, who I had the honour to meet a couple of years ago. Uh, Harold was an 18-year-old uh, youngster from the United States, um, married an English girl and ended up living in the Wigan area. Um, sadly, he passed away last year, um, but the year before that, he was quite poorly, uh, but wanted to make the effort to come to the Heritage Centre, so he came down with his daughter. He managed to get it into this um, cockpit display, and he managed to get himself into the co-pilot seat, which is where he'd last sat in 1948, um, when he managed to blag a trip to uh, Germany because he wanted to see for himself what was going on. The pilot said to him, pick yourself a parachute, don't let me see you getting in the aircraft. And he basically gave him a, a freebie ride to uh, Frankfurt and back, showed him some of the other cities that had been bombed. Infamously, Harold was so in, uh, con, uh, intent on looking out of the, air, the aircraft windows from, from the side, uh, but not getting a very good view. So the pilot said to him, come and sit up. In the co-pilot seat, he can get out for a while. You'll see the view looking forward, which not too many people get to see while an aeroplane's in the air. So Harold was then transfixed by the sights he could see um, out of the cockpit windows. But he sensed there was something wrong. Uh, when he looked across to the um, port side of the aircraft, he realised that it was only actually him on the flight deck because the pilot was missing. Uh, basically, the whole crew was stood halfway down the back of the plane with their arms folded, laughing their heads off because Harold was flying, technically, the aircraft. What he didn't know was they put it on automatic pilot. But he said just for a few seconds, he, he got quite a strong feeling of um, panic. Um, ever such a nice guy, but it's nice to be able to relay stories like that from, from people who actually flew there. He worked on the airlift. That's another great story, John. You're you're surpassing yourself in the, in the great stories today. I really appreciate these. So yeah, there's a there's a plaque on the outside of the aircraft, and it says this display is dedicated to the memory of Francis J. Roy, 1930 to 2016, Berlin airlift veteran who served at Burton Wood, 1949 to 51. Rest in peace, Frank. Right. So we're now going to look at the um, replica of the uh, the chapel that was on the base and as you can hear we're getting closer to the amusement park so what can you uh, tell us about what I'm looking at here well because there were so many troops based at Burtonwood inevitably uh, romance blossomed with the local girls um, seven and a half thousand we believe married local girls just from Burton Wood. Um, in the display that we have here, we've got three original GI bride dresses from the 1950s. All the girls here, uh, are depicted by the dresses, married um, guys who were based at Burton Wood. Uh, they were donated to us by the families um, because it was thought that now this display is going in, uh, the, the dresses were all in attics or stuffed in cupboards somewhere, in wardrobes away. And the ladies realise that there's over 25,000 people a year going to see them if they're on display in here. And so they were quite happy for them to, to come over from the States and to, to be put on display in the uh, the chapel that we have here. Um, luckily, we had some visitors came in, some ladies who actually ran a, a bridal shop in Liverpool. And they came and brought all the hoops and everything else that go with the dresses, which we didn't have to make them look even more spectacular. So we're, we're, we're um, grateful to that happening. Um, and then around the building, 
if anybody can give us information and photographs of the weddings, we'll quite happily put them on display for people to read because it's a fascinating story with the GI brides um, and we still get them back today. Uh, last, um, last year we had a reunion and I took four GI brides into Warrington Town Centre and we managed to get into the casino ballroom just briefly because all four of them had met the husbands in that ballroom in town. It's now a gym, um, but the casino was very, very popular with the Americans. There's some great stories on the on the walls here of um, uh, local girls that met their husbands and uh, some great photos as well. Some great period photos, but some great up-to-date photos showing some uh, really strong and in- enduring marriages. How popular were the American troops with the local lads? If you know what, what were there any issues there? Uh, probably many issues. Um, they were certainly popular with the local girls, but the local lads uh, were not too favoured to the uh, to the Americans in general um, because they tended to have an awful lot of money and an awful lot of um, draw to the local girls. So. Uh, one or two tasty moments happened in the town centres, shall we say, uh, over the years. But later on, um, things settled down, uh, especially after the war years, um, and they became more of an accepted part of the town. Yeah, more embedded as part of the uh, the community. I mean, it must have been quite a loss to the town and employment when the base left, because that's what I've seen with uh, other US Air Force bases as well around the country. Well, massive. Um, I mean, at its height in the war years, 18,500 Americans were fed into a town which had a population of about 65,000. <clears> so we're bordering about 20% of the, the um, population of Warrington became American. Um, if you think about all the money that went into the uh, local area out of, from the Americans, it, it would have been massive. And that was there on a, in large numbers up until 1959, really. Um, to a lesser degree once the uh, the army took it over in 67 because there were probably three maybe 400 troops here then so a, a shadow of its former self really but certainly during the war years and through the 50s it was a massive impact on the local economy right okay well what we're now going to look at is uh a one of the buildings here that represents some of the later stages of burton woods cold war history when it became a a uh, big storage base for equipment needed should the Cold War have turned hot. Okay, we're now uh, opposite a hut labelled 7,559th Motor Vehicle Repair, Squ- Repair Squadron, and uh, inside is a Jeep. What can you tell me about this? Well, the Jeep is the very last one. Um off the inventory at Burtonwood. It was donated to us by the American Army. When we got it, (coughs) it actually had 64 miles on the clock. Um, Currently has about 1,700 miles on the clock. Um, So it's it's not running yet, to be perfectly honest with you. It's fully (laughs) operable. Uh, Built in 1976, it was the replacement, really, for the Willis. Um, And they started to build them in in the 1950s. Uh, it's a little more modern under the bonnet than the Willis and it's on independent coil spring suspension so it rides a little bit better as well 2,000 of them were on stock here up until about 1990 um, when a lot of them were shipped out to um, to the first Gulf War and the rest of them were sold off when Burton Wood was actually closed uh, to sort of the Israeli armies and the Mexican armies etc um, so we're very glad to have it here it's one of our main displays does it ever get a, a run around or not? It does. We've just had to put two new batteries on it because obviously it doesn't get run around that much. But those last batteries lasted 12 years in that state. So we thought we did quite well out of that. Uh, but yeah, we run it around here. We run it around the car park. We will tow it to events. And we actually put it to, into a school last year for a week so the children could do a, a Burton Wood week before we then took the veterans on the reunion into the school, which was a brilliant day. Um, and the Jeep helped no end because everybody wanted a photograph taken in the seat. Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, on the side of the hut, there's a photo of the interior of Burton Wood in the late 1980s, where there was some massive warehousing, um, and you can. There's apparently 2,000 of these jeeps were um, stored here. 
Oh, they, they were selling them off to the Israeli and the Mexican army. So they weren't selling them off like the uh, post-war Jeeps for £5 and, and £10. No, they weren't. Um, <clears throat> this Jeep had some, somewhat of a, a bad reputation. Um, certainly the Mark One version of it. We've got the Mark II, which the problem was corrected. But the Mark One Jeep had a transverse leaf spring set up. For those of you old enough to remember the old Triumph Herald, very similar to that. Only the problem was that if you cornered too quickly in it, the rear wheel would fold underneath and throw the contents of the vehicle into the oncoming traffic. I believe over 270 GIs got killed in the Mark 1 version of these Jeeps. And so that, that any Mark 1 Jeeps were actually written off stock and crushed. Um, they corrected it for this particular model and these ran, they were still in use uh, up to the Gulf, first Gulf War. Um, but at that point, they were getting replaced by the Humvees, which uh, are still current on the uh, the um, American inventory. Right. Wow. I mean, that that's one of the, the hidden stories of the Cold War, is the people who were killed through accidents and, you know, th things like you, you've just described. I mean, that's an incredible number. Yeah, that's right. I mean, um, we go back to the airlift at the start. I think there's about, in total, about 80 people killed as a result of the airlift um the RAF i think lost about 31 and the american air force lost in the region of 40 people <laughs> john has a rather bad cough he so uh, he's he's battling on we're almost there john <laughs> yeah um yeah so about 80 people there plus obviously then <coughs> other people killed uh, out, <coughs> out in germany um working in and around berlin uh they're the they're the ones that actually disappear on the on the historical figures, really, because it's just classed as a Cold War. It never got hot, thankfully, so it's a kind of forgotten era in a lot of ways. Absolutely, and I, d I don't think there was a medal for the Berlin Airlift either, was there? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's a medal for the Berlin Airlift. We have one here. They get, they, there's a class for it and everything. Um, I can show you that later. Okay. In the is that RAF or is that just US Air Force? That The one we have is a US Air Force one. I do believe the RAF had a humanitarian medal produced for it as well oh okay okay i've learned well i've learned loads today but that, that's an interesting fact i wasn't aware of what would you say is your most prized exhibit that you have here aside from possibly the aircraft cockpit i think the most prized exhibit we've got are actually the memories and the stories that we get told by the people who served here it's their story that we're, we're here to preserve the memory of. And whilst we've got thousands of bits and pieces of kit and everything, and there's nothing really more important than the other, but what is important are the people who were here and the achievements and the memories of the things they did. That, that for me, is the most important thing. I'd, I'd like to second that. I think that that's a great tribute to the people who served here and also how the, the local population helped make them feel at home and and make a success of the base i highly highly recommend you come and visit the burton wood heritage center it's just off the m62 halfway between manchester and liverpool it is free to get in but they welcome donations check the opening times on their website and i'll be posting a link to that on the show notes Thank you very much, John, for your time today. It's been a fascinating time. It's been a pleasure to do it. We encourage people to come down. It's, it's part of the North West history that a lot of people don't know too much about, but we're only too pleased to relay the story to, uh, of RF Burtonwood to anybody that wishes to come round. Well, that's all we had time for, but there are links to the RAF Burtonwood Heritage Centre videos and other websites in the show notes the show notes are at coldwarconversations.com slash the word episode and the number 74 now i'm putting together a special 30th anniversary episode of the fall of the berlin wall so if you have any accounts you would like to share do email me at ian at coldwarpod.com that's ian at coldwarpod.com if you like what you're listening to, you can really help us by leaving reviews on iTunes, Stitcher, our Facebook page, or with your favourite podcast provider. This really helps raise our profile and get new guests on the show. 
If you can't wait for the next episode, our Facebook discussion group is where our guests and listeners just like you continue the Cold War conversation. Thank you very much for listening. It is really appreciated. Goodbye. Goodbye.